Mary is someone that I think Mary and Tom don't need introductions. They have been uh, true legends in the field of uh, agile software, and Mary was uh, the one who started the whole lean software development movement. Uh, deeply, deeply influenced uh, at least my thinking and a lot of uh, other folks in the community. So, I uh, want to thank you, Mary, for everything that you've done over the years, and uh, it's so nice to have you part of Agile India back. I think we had you a few years ago, but uh, it's been a while, so it's great to see you. And the virtual conference made it uh, much more easy and possible to, to have. All right, so without much delay, I uh, want to uh, let Mary uh, start with her very important topic, which is more relevant now than ever before uh, with the pandemic. So uh, Mary, if you're going to please go ahead and share your slides. So good evening or morning or whatever it is where you are, everybody. I want to talk about a week several months ago here in Minnesota, where I am, it was March 17th, 2020. And where you are, I don't know what exact week, but it was around about the same time. And everything changed, like very fast. It was a call to action. It was time for us to, well, first of all, everybody needed to go home, whether they were in school or working, and we, were called upon to figure out how to make that possible. So they needed equipment, tools, licenses. They needed, the kids needed internet access and hotspots and maybe even lunch. And the professors had to figure out how to use new tools. There was training, support. How do we put these meetings together? There was security to worry about. How do teams talk to each other? All kinds of stuff. And it was everybody. And it was three days, or maybe it was a week, or maybe it was tomorrow, it depended upon. But, you know, it was very fast, impossibly fast. And it wasn't like you could say, no, that's not possible. Because had we known four weeks earlier that we we're going to do all of that stuff in the short amount of time, we would have said, no, nah, it's not possible. But that wasn't the option in this case. So around the globe, the impossible had to happen. And it did. Um, for example, my granddaughter got stuck in uh, uh, Morocco and we had to figure out with travel suppliers how to get the two of them back home through Canada where they were living, where their car was parked and back to Rochester, New York. And we were, there were a whole ton of people trying to move people around the world. The professors and the kindergarten teachers and all of those folks had to learn how to teach online. Um, the stores that did remain open had to figure out how to get people to buy things. And as far as I was concerned, I was not going into a store. And every store around me took maybe one week or two weeks or sometimes a month to figure out how to make it possible for me to order online, drive to the store, uh, call inside. They came and put my food in the, or whatever I was buying in the car and off I drove, and I still shop that way. And maybe a few home deliveries, but mostly drive to local stores and pick stuff up that I ordered online. And Zoom became a verb. Um, and Odd Hub teams just swarmed one problem after another. I had two stores here, one that, const that started out with the capability of having all their inventory and money for about 2% of their uh, clients, they could do this curbside, what we call curbside pickup. Within a week, they had managed to scale. And within two weeks, you couldn't tell that it was the same service. It was so much improved. A second store around here, two weeks later, nothing had changed because they were waiting for some contract vendor to have some time for them. Well, at the first store, I'm sure what happened is a whole bunch of people got on a team and it wasn't just software people. It was all the different people needed to know how to get the inventory right, figure out how to do the massive amount of picking and how to where to store the stuff, how to deliver and how to get my information into the store. Whole bunches of problems with every one of these things. And a team got together, one problem after another, and figured out how to solve it. And it wasn't software teams that did this. It was software engineers joining teachers or store workers or procurement experts or call center staff or whoever, and everybody getting together and picking one piece of the problem and figuring it out and then the next piece of the problem and making it workable and then making it better and then making it better. 
everybody knew what success looked like. We were home in three days, like it or not. Um, did we have access to our teachers? Everybody in that team didn't have to be told when they were successful. They knew when they were making progress. And speed was essential. And you know what? It, it wasn't like you had a choice. It wasn't like these impossible things you could say, well, no, no, that just can't happen. It was a, okay, what's the, what can we do towards that goal? So many companies went through this digital transformation that they were thinking about in less than a week. For example, Twitter had been working on exploring and doing experiments with working from home. And at that point, they had two or three people or two or three percent of their workforce working from home. And they've been working for two years and it took like a week and everybody was home. Uh, they hadn't thought it was possible. So this massive experiment, which turned out actually quite well for them. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, but lots of companies took this digital transformation that they were thinking about and they had to make it happen. They had to make it possible for everybody to work digitally. And in this case, you see that it was not about software. It was about providing the technology infrastructure to accomplish something that was really urgent and much bigger than software. And when we are in teams, that's what we tend to be thinking about. Something is bigger than the software because actually software is, does never really matter. It's always about something bigger. And as you will see on this uh, next first part of the presentation, I think that it's important for us to be on the team that deals with the bigger problem, not on a sub team that somebody else tells what to do. We learned a lot about each other when we were home because we were talking with our coworkers and we could see that, guess what? They're real people. They have children. They have dogs. In the background, we saw some guitars hanging and some bikes hanging. And back here is all of uh, an assortment of some of the pictures that Tom has taken over the years. And um, we learned empathy. We learned to think about our coworkers as somebody, not just that corporate person, that comes into work every day, but somebody that is sort of a real person. And we learned a lot about management because the supervisors couldn't go into work and see people and check out what they were doing and stuff like that. They, so responsibility just basically had to replace this micromanagement or close supervision that many supervisors had been used to. Or it didn't because there was a bunch of what's called workforce optimization software, you know, where you could check and see whether or not somebody was sitting there and what app they were in and all of that sort of stuff and monitor exactly what was going on. But hey, you know what? Hey, Mary, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. I think some people are uh, finding that your slides are uh, completely going dark. Uh, they're not able to see. If you don't mind, could you just stop sharing and start try once more? Just Thank you. And if you could just try again. Okay. And share is over here. And here we go. And okay. And just turn your camera back on. Oh, yeah. Okay. We can do that. Camera. Ta -da. Okay. All right. Let's try that. Thanks. Sorry for the. I was turning the camera off. If that helps to. Let's try it. If it doesn't, I'll I'll let you know. Okay. I see so, a lot of hands up, so hopefully people are able to see. I see a lot of hands going up. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Barry O'Reilly uh, wrote an interesting blog called "Why Your Company Isn't Profiting from Remote Productivity," and he said, "In a distributed world where people are all over." We have to relearn how you think about management. And one of the most important things to think about is um, you need to create a strong connection between work effort and customer satisfaction. You need to have an immediate connection between somebody doing work and the customer receiving the benefit of that. And that's motivating. So if we think about that um, and we say, has this here been successful, this working from home thing. If you define success as productivity, then you know what? 
at first there was more output for the same amount of input, and later on productivity fell. Uh, and uh, that's interesting, but that's probably not the right way to define success. As Jeff Patton just spent a whole bunch of time telling you, success is about output. It's about the delighted customers. It's about the kids at home able to see and the professors able to teach. And when teams have responsibility for achieving the customer satisfaction, making it possible for me to drive up and pick up my groceries, yes, absolutely. Working from home was as successful as before. Um, teams with proxies, maybe not. So proxies. By proxies, I mean two things. One thing I mean is proxy measurements, like things like cost, schedule, scope, number of tasks done, stuff like that. And I also mean an intermediary between the team and what it is and their customers. Something that is an intermediary connection. And that's a, that's a proxy too. Like, for example, the business is a proxy for allowing software teams to be connected with the customers. So if you think about teams with proxies, maybe it's been not so successful. Um, what... Uh, Barry O'Reilly says is those managers who controlled, who went for outcomes rather than outputs, they didn't have a whole bunch of trouble switching to remote work. They might not have liked it, but they didn't have much trouble because their natural impulse was here are the top things, figure out how to solve them. And here's how we're going to know that they're, they're working, or here's how you can see that they're working and then support the outcomes that help solve the problems. Well, those managers didn't have to really change the way they managed because that worked remotely just as well as it worked while people were in the, in, in the office. But for managers who are used to measuring tasks and having intermediary, intermediaries, proxies, figure out whether or not it was the right thing, that's something different. Um, Twitter, I said I was going to uh, mention again, they um, switched very fast to working from home and discovered you know, because they had to do it, that it was actually really successful and a whole lot of people loved it. Now, that doesn't mean everybody likes it. It doesn't mean everybody wanted to work from home. But they estimate, they said in May that they're going to allow anybody who wants to stay working from home can. And they estimate about 50% of their people are going to work from home. It's not about letting people uh, work from home. It's about letting people work from where they feel the most comfortable working from. They don't have to ask permission. They don't have to feel guilty. They work where they would prefer to work. And I want to show something more than just that. Sorry, back again here. Uh, I think the problem still exists. So maybe if I can just request you to turn off your camera, let the yep. slides be there. Thank you so much. And does that help? Uh, folks, are you able to see the screen now better? Do a thumbs up. Doesn't seem to, does it? Oh, there. Okay. Oh, yeah. So maybe it's the video on top. Well, you don't need to see me, that's for sure. <laughs> right. Okay. So um, I want to talk about job content. And um, this is from a very recent book. It's a book on economics by uh, Roger Martin. And it's kind of an interesting book uh, about that was finished just in January before there was any concept of a pandemic. And in that particular book, he is talking about when more is not better, basically the stuff that we've learned in the last few months. Now, the most interesting thing I found in that book was this chart. And this is a chart of the workforce in the United States divided into four groups. The first group is, um, the first group is gr people doing remote work and it is sold locally, or excuse me, routine work that is sold locally. And in the U.S., about um, this is the percentage of workforce. This goes from 50, zero to 50. And about 40, say 4% of the workforce in the U.S. does routine work that's sold in their local area. And the next piece is uh, other routine work, routine work that's sold uh, someplace else. For example, if you happen to do outsourcing and people give you detailed tasks to do, you're doing routine work. I'll talk about that in a minute. And it's sold someplace other than where you live. And in the U.S., that's about 20% of the workforce. And in um, 
other the next category is creative work that's sold locally, like if you're an architect or something like that. And then the final category is other creative work that's sold outside of your local area. Now, the important thing here is how he talks about creative work. In creative work, workers exercise meaningful, independent judgment and decision-making in order to do their job. And that's important, meaningful, independent judgment and decision-making. And um, it's not, here's a task, do it. It's here's a goal to think about and have your ideas about how to make it work. So if we look here, um, and the first, this here is in the year 2000. Over here on the right, we have 12 years later in the year 2012. And if you look at here, there's two boxes and one is hiding behind the other. And this is routine work sold locally. And it has just about the same, what you see is a salary range here, bottom to top. And the salary range used to be from about, say, uh, oh, $10,000 a year to about, say, uh, $30,000, $35,000 a year. And it hasn't changed. And here is the next one. And it is routine work sold outside the local region. And there's fewer people doing it. It went from 20% to 18%. And the upper salary is just a little bit higher in 12 years. Here is creative work sold locally, as I said, um, people who are artists and that sort of thing that sell, or, or if you are working at a local store and doing the software for it or something like that, then the salary range is about 22000 to about 60000 used to be, and it's gone up now to maybe 75000 and there's a few more people doing that. And in 2012, this was the green spot was really where you wanted to be. Creative work sold outside your local region. Because at that point in time, the salary had gone from, say, 82000 to 100000 a year. And um, that was the place where there were the fewest workers, only maybe 12%. But that is definitely where you would like to live. And that's where a whole bunch of software engineers would love to live and should be living. And so what I'm saying is, look at your job. If you're completing tasks, that's not the kind of job you want. You want to look for a job that gives you the responsibility to figure out how to delight customers, not have somebody else tell you what that means. So I'm going to talk about this word respect. Uh, I could call it responsibility, but in this case, I think it also shows respect. When workers solve critical problems without proxies between them and the results of their work. And... Uh, Naresh will tell you I'm big on this. This is not the first time I've talked about it. But I think it's really important to think about um, respecting the people who do software engineering. I want to say how we do this in our world because this is not something that's hard to do. Uh, there is a model, and it's I'm going to call it the responsible engineer model. It's, it's, it's if you look at SpaceX, here's a Falcon rocket. And it has various stages. This is what systems engineering is all about. And you can see the different stages. And there will be a chief engineer or a responsible engineer for every single one of those components, landing legs, gill fins, you name it. And that there will be a team. And within that team, the responsible engineer will have some people responsible for subsets of that components. And there will be a responsible engineer for the entire uh, rocket. And the concept doesn't have any, SpaceX doesn't have a software department. The, the, the payload has a, soft, has a hardware piece and software engineers and all the people necessary to do everything in the payload. And every single one of those components has a team and their job is to make sure that their piece works and does its job as part of the whole thing. Now, um, this is February 6, uh, 2018, when three of those rockets were tied together and put Falcon Heavy up into the sky, and they landed the booster lock rockets because they've been trying for five years to figure out how to get those things to come down safely and be able to be reused instead of dumped into the ocean or burned up in the sky. Because if you can drop the price of putting stuff in space dramatically, you could put a lot more stuff in space and do interesting things. Between 1970 and 2000, 
for all those many years, the cost to put a kilogram into space was, a, uh, you know, eighteen, nineteen thousand dollars $19,000 per kilo. But now it costs more, just under $3,000 U.S. dollars to put a kilo into space. That's a factor of seven reduction. And that reduction came through, I would propose, really intensive and good engineering. And they operate on what they call the philosophy of responsibility. What does that mean? That means engineers are responsible for the design and development of a component and for making sure they understand how their component should operate and how it, uh, what its job is as part of the overall system. And they're not just responsible for making it work. They're responsible for making sure that it does its part in the overall system. And uh, the launch director at SpaceX, John Mertroni, says there is no engineering process in existence that can replace the philosophy of responsibility for getting things done right and getting things done efficiently. And that's how they figured out how to make this happen. They didn't go for perfection on every test launch. They went for um Everybody did their part. They had to instrument it because every time that one of those boosters crashed while they were developing it, and they crashed a lot, <clears throat> the uh, Elon Musk was going to call within 24 hours, and he expected to talk to the engineers that were responsible for the problem, and they were going to tell him how it was never going to happen again. So this concept of the responsible engineer can put space rocks into science or into the, into space. If it can do that, it can probably do the stuff that you guys have to accomplish. Um, efficient supply chains. This is sort of part two of my talk. And I know I've got to get going here because I have like only maybe 20, 25 minutes left. But uh, what happened is that efficient supply chains just plain collapsed um, as soon as the, everybody got locked down. Because there were dramatic demand shifts that couldn't be accommodated. For example, personal protective equipment. There just wasn't enough where it needed to be. And there needed to be more made. There were cleaning supplies like hand sanitizer and soap that we couldn't get for the longest time. Um, food. Food shortages mostly in, um, well, what we saw, interestingly enough, was a persistent shortage of flour. And the reason was because um, the flour was... Uh, packaged in commercial packages and sent to bakeries. And when the bakeries closed, they had all the flour, they had plenty of mills, but they didn't have the packaging supplies to put it into. We put it in five or 10 pound bags and sell it in grocery stores. They didn't have either the equipment or the packaging to do that. And there was a two, three month strong shortage of flour in the U S other countries had different shortages, but it was a supply chain problem. Usually. Now, infrastructure actually uh, didn't tend to, if you had water and electricity, you tended to still have water and electricity. If you had internet, it uh, didn't tend to go away. In fact, our internet, almost every vendor started supplying higher speeds and more of it fast. So the question is, why do supply chains break and why doesn't infrastructure break? And there are really only two reasons why a supply chain will break. First of all, the demand changes faster than the time in the supply chain. So if you have personal protective equipment and it's made in China and then it has to go on a container into a container and it makes its way to a port and then it's on a ship and then another port and then it has to make its way to a distribution center and eventually get to a hospital, that's a long time. If demand changes faster and demand change like within a week, um, then the long supply chain, that supply chain breaks. And secondly, if demand exceeds capacity at a link in the supply chain, like, for example, we had plenty of flour, but we couldn't package it. At that link, the demand exceeded the capacity. So those are the two reasons why a supply chain will break. Um, if we go back to the first one and look at it closely, durable goods supply chains, anything like refrigerators and appliances and even bicycles, they're, they're very slow and very unresponsive because um, make it the most efficient, cheapest place in the world and gradually sort of move it over to where it's needed. And when you have to rapidly change that supply chain, it's too slow. 
Perishable goods supply chains actually are much faster and much more responsive. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And infrastructure, infrastructure does not tend to be designed for a single thing. It tends to be designed for the long term, not current demand. So if you're going to plant a tree in a park, that tree is going to be small for 10, 15, 20 years before it even starts to be big. But that's okay. It's infrastructure. And so you do it because you're thinking long ways out in the future when you plant the tree. Um, when you look at the second one, okay, demanding exceeding a capacity at a link in the supply chain, resilient supply chains have some sort of slack at every single step. And if you don't, you are not going to be able to respond to rapid change in um, demand. And another thing that you want to look at in a supply chain links is you do not want links to be tightly coupled so that when one thing changes, you get a cascading failure across the whole network. We see that oftentimes in power grids, interestingly enough. Loose coupling limits what we have a habit of calling the blast radius of failures. Those are the two things to think about when we look at the links of the supply chain. With infrastructure, the, the, it's designed for aggregated maximum demand. So it doesn't actually care if the demand is coming from homes or offices. The flower does, but the infrastructure doesn't. And so, therefore, infrastructure tends to be much more resilient. So let's go back to uh, Roger Martin's book on the relentless, on uh, when more is not better. And he says the relentless pursuit of efficiency has created very fragile supply chains. And boy, could we see that. So what we've been trying to do is optimize supply chain for efficiency at every single step, whether it's low wages at the creation step, big batches in the transport step, uh, long distances for distribution. It's very slow. There's no redundancy and strong dependencies. And if we want to live in a world that's going to change fast and, and, and unexpectedly, then we've got to stop doing that. We have to start looking at um, something more like the bazaar. You might remember in the late 1990s, Eric Raymond wrote the book, The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And the bazaar or the marketplace was, um, in, in his metaphor, cathedral was a strongly architected development processes and the bazaar was the way open source was developed. Everybody had their own little shop and did their own little thing. And he said he couldn't figure out how the bazaar could possibly work, but it turns out it works a lot better for software. And in fact, it works a lot better for a lot of supply chains. For example, if you look at perishable goods, um, the last thing that you want to do with milk uh, or, or meat or, or fruit, perishable fruits, most vegetables, is optimized for resource efficiency or for high utilization of resources. It doesn't make any sense. So if this woman with her bike and all her bundles of vegetables and fruits um, were going to be really efficient, she would take the stuff to a truck that was at a distribution center, and then that truck would get driven to the market. But that doesn't make any sense. Those things need to go in small batches straight to the market, and she can get it there fastest. You never accumulate large batches when you're talking about perishable goods because small batches move faster um, and they don't sit in great big piles of inventory. Well, you also have to, with perishable goods, aggressively discover and eliminate any kind of bottleneck. So we get a lot of our fresh fruit from South America. And uh, if the airplanes don't fly, we don't get it. And so you have to look, is this a bottleneck? Is it redundant? Um, and then if it has to wait at the airport because there aren't enough trucks to distribute it, then you've got to ha handle that bottleneck. And with a perishable good supply chain, you replenish what people buy. And you use that to pull your replenishment. And lastly, you leverage customer feedback to make product supply decisions. What is she going to plant? She's going to plant what people buy. And uh, maybe that's going to have a little bit of a lag time, but not that much. So the thing that we always talk about for any kind of thing that's optimized for speed rather than for resource efficiency is don't batch and queue. Okay, well, so what is a batch and what is a queue? Well, projects are batches. 
Not a good idea. Backlogs are cues. Not a good idea either. Prioritization is just ways to reshuffle the queue. That's kind of a waste of time. You don't need the queue in the first place. Estimates, they're another way of figuring out which piece of the queue am I going to work on next. Every one of these things belongs to a push system. They are about forecasting demand. But in times of uncertainty, push systems are going to be wrong because things change so fast. So all of the forecasting in the world that people did in January certainly didn't help in March. The thing you want to do in an uncertain environment, even in ours, is to pull from demand. So what does this mean for you? Well, what it tends to, the way to think about it is to establish a regular cadence of getting stuff done. So you should know the rate at which you get stuff done. Let me give you an example. There is a, a, a author who was interviewing Tom and me for an article she was writing for a, a website. Uh, I think it was a, an employment website. And she was going to interview us about estimates. And she wanted to know what estimates were all about. And I said, well, let me ask you something. How many articles do you write in a month? And she said, eight. I said, oh, you write eight articles a month. Would you ever accept 12? She said, of course not. I write eight a month. And um, she doesn't plan out more than, you know, a few weeks or something like that. So she wouldn't even imagine that it would make any sense to accept 12 a month. You know your delivery rate of stuff that's done. You've got the data somewhere. Don't accept demand at a rate higher than you deliver. It's pretty simple. Don't accept stuff and put it on some sort of backlog at a rate higher than you deliver. And while you're at it, you only need a short buffer of work to absorb variation between the demand and the delivery. And if you have a short buffer and you only accept work at the at the rate that you complete it and, and not at any higher rate, you basically have a very rapid way to respond to pull from demand. So that's the second section of what I want to talk about. Now I'm going to go into the last one. Because the last thing we saw was a recession or a depression or something like that, which we are still in the middle of. Now we know about disruption in our world. This is a picture that Tom took, and it is on the cover of our first book. And he took it in May of 2002. And that's important because this is Tom's first digital camera. And by that time, Tom had been a photography for a photographer for a lot of years. We have a whole bunch of scanned pictures of all the colored prints and slides that he's made. But he took this picture on this, on this trip because it was a little tiny thing that he could fit into the into the into the bin on the bike, and you know what? It's three megapixels. And he never went back to film. If you look at Kodak versus Fujifilm, this is a graph of the demand, and on the left it starts in 1994, and the peak where the arrow is at the top is March 2003. That was the peak demand for color film. And by 2012, it was down at the bottom, sort of near the top of the bike here, right here, okay? Um, and it just fell off a cliff, just like that. Lots of things have done that. But the thing to see is that um, Kodak didn't respond. They kept trying to make what they were doing work better. And within 10 years, they had lost basically uh, 50% of their revenue. On the other hand, Fujifilm, um, in the same time period, their revenue went up 60% almost. How is that happen? Well, as soon as they start seeing the demand fall out, fell off, they accepted it and said, you know, we got to do something different. They did a little bit. They quit doing research on film. They uh, supported a few of their most important businesses for a while, but pretty much they tried to switch to something else. And that something else turned out to be pharmaceuticals because uh, and beauty products, because that's where their, their assets and their intelligent people could use the same skills that they'd been using before towards a different product. In 2012, Kodak declared bankruptcy. And by that time, Fujifilm was doing just fine. In fact, they quit calling themselves Fujifilm and called themselves Fuji. 
And we have the same story here with Netflix, which you can see. You probably have heard of Netflix, but have you heard of Blockbuster? Because Blockbuster um, was a a storefront video rental place in the United States. We had about 3,000 of them. By 2004, they had $6 billion of revenue coming in. They were very successful. You go in and you rented videos, um, and they had late fees, which really annoyed people because those late fees were kind of pain. Um, And so then uh, Netflix started up. And they had a different scheme, DVD by mail, and it was flat fee, three a month. You return one, you got a new one, you would never have late fees. Whoa. So people loved it. They switched. And then Netflix said, okay, no late fees. We're going to do DVD by mail too. Return it to Star, and you can get your new video faster. And everybody thought that would be great. But then Blockbuster said, oh, how about streaming? You can have a, you can add two or three hours of streaming a month to your DVD subscription. How about that? That became popular. And at the same part point, uh, net blockbuster was not able to get enough revenue. So they returned the late fees and, um, they then decided with down with streaming, what they were going to do is put a kiosk in each store where people could download movies, bring it to home, bring it home on a chip, put the chip in some sort of a player that they sold. And, uh, as you can imagine, it didn't go over as well as streaming. And so they kept falling in revenue. They kept adding additional late fees and, and annoying customers even more. At the same time, Netflix switched to a streaming-only subscription. And let's just say the rest is history. So we know how to survive disruption. And the first thing we have to do is stop doing what doesn't work. We know we have to stop doing what doesn't work. We have to stop annoying our customers, and you'd be surprised at the kinds of things we do. Uh, The airlines in the U.S. charged all kinds of fees for luggage and for changing flights and stuff. They had to drop all those fees just to get customers to come back. Well, we have one airline that never had any of those fees, and it's doing quite well, thank you. You need to preserve cash in any kind of a downturn. And you need to stop spending it on the old stuff that you used to be doing and figure out how you're going to spend it next. You need to find some sort of unmet need and leverage your existing expertise and assets towards that need with a lot of short customer-focused feedback loops. This is our motto at 3M that we always had. Try a lot of stuff and keep what's work. Keep what works. So there's a story and there's these stories all over the world, but I like this one of the pizza factory in Chicago that started making face masks instead. They make about 5,000 a day. Can you imagine that? Of these face masks for medical workers because they found that the pieces of plexiglass could be treated just as if they were pizzas, heated in the oven, bent to shape, uh, and then they added a few accessories and they were able to package them up and sell them. And the world is full of people who figured out how to repurpose assets and people towards a different concept. What I'm talking about is something that I'm going to call maneuverability. Maneuverability. These are Impala. They are the fastest animals I've ever seen. You know, they will hold this pose. I'm amazed that Tom got the picture because that didn't last for more than a second. And then their heads were up and they were looking for the lions and the leopards that wanted them for lunch. So... In their case, maneuverability is survival. And maneuverability, I think, in a, a times of great uncertainty is survival. This is um, uh, an F-86 plane in the early 50s. In 52, John Boyd was a Sabre pilot, and he was supposed to get into fights with Soviet MiG-15s, which were faster. They had heavier firepower. They had a narrower turning radius. But you know what? They did not actually uh, have the advantage you would think because by the end of the air-to-air combat, the Sabres, these little slow planes, had a 10-to-1 ratio of success. So Boy thought this was really weird, and he wanted to know what was it about that plane that made it so successful. And he did a lot of studies and a lot of simulations, and he decided that, he discovered that the success is a byproduct of its ability to transition from one maneuver 
to the next maneuver faster than the opponent. And I would propose that that's what we need to be able to figure out how to do. So here is his OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. I'm going to call it a maneuverability loop. And you have to observe what's going on. Orientation I'm going to talk about in a minute. And you have to decide based on the orientation, what are you going to do next? You call it a hypothesis. And then you act. And your action is a test. Did it work or not? And then you go through the loop again. So if we take a look at this central thing right here, what we're doing in orientation is we have a mental model of how the world works. And what you're doing with maneuverability is you're saying, What's wrong with my mental model because it isn't working? How am I going to change my mental model of how the world works to match the way it works today? And you have to make, you have to update your mental models and you have to do it fast. So you have like genetic heritage, like so the Zampalas are really fast. You have cultural traditions. If you look at air uh, pilots, they have different kinds of traditions than, I don't know, army or something like that. Uh, there's previous experiences. If you've been through this before, it helps a lot. There's new information because this is different than before. You put that all together in synthesis. Now, if you want to think about this, we're looking for a broad view of what the mental model could be changed to to try something new. And I would propose that if you have a team, a small team, has to be small because otherwise it can't act fast. And uh, it'll have a broad view of the environment, it can form some mental models, and it has some diversity of opinions so that you don't keep doing what you used to do. Lots of different minds, not one expert. And so when you have that in the orientation box, you are much less like, more likely to come up with a mental model that's going to work for the next thing, for what's going on now, if you have a small, diverse, responsible team. So I think the thing we need to do is to figure out how we're going to solve for maneuverability. And in our world, this is how you do that. This is a book by um, Je Jeff Gothel and Josh Seiden, and it's called Sense and Respond. And the, thing to, the important thing to know about those two guys is they are designers. They design things. And this is the way designers think about the world. So they say what you need to do is maintain a continuous two-way conversation with your market talk, figure out both directions, try something, see what they say. You want small, multidiscipline teams, and I don't mean software teams. I mean everybody involved in the, the lighting customers. You want a very clear goal. You want to know the outcomes, and you want to know what are the constraints. If your constraint is the, a deadline that can't move, like three days, that's a constraint. If your constraint is there's only so much money, that's a constraint. A constraint is no list of tasks. It's the real thing that, that without hitting, that, that you can't violate. The team needs freedom to act asynchronously, separately, without permission from colleagues, without permission from management, by themselves. Um, and that is usually an architectural problem as much as anything in our world. The team has to be responsible for building the right thing. Um, I'll just re remind you of my re philosophy of responsibility. That's what their responsibility is, figuring out what's right and making it work. There should be frequent delivery to customers so they can learn their way forward. That's a quote from Sense and Respond. Learn your way forward. And success has to be customer outcomes, not how much output there is, not proxies, but customer outcomes. So the new normal today Resilience isn't a luxury. We have discovered that resilience is pretty fundamental when the world changes so fast. So what we need for that is three things. One is responsibility. Workers should solve customer problems without proxies. And we need maneuverability, a freedom to act asynchronously and without permission. If you look at AWS, for example, one of the things that makes them so maneuverable is they're basically composed of uh, small teams that can act asynchronously without permission. And their whole architecture, in fact, the whole cloud architecture is designed around making that possible. And lastly, you should pull from demand. Manage by rate. 
Know your rate. That's the rate at which you can accept, not just deliver. Maintain a very short first-in, first-out queue, and that's all you need. So if you have those three things in place, then you're going to have a lot more resilience in your organization than um, if you don't. And so with that, I would like to say thank you, and I think it's time for questions. So what should I do, Naresh? Stop sharing. Great. Uh, thanks, Mary. If you could uh, just uh, turn on your camera, stop sharing. We, I'll go through a few questions here. Okay. Is my camera on now? Camera on. Oops, whoops. There we go. Yeah, I can see you. Fine. Okay. And Tom is going to join too. Awesome. Welcome, Tom. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Okay. Uh, right. There we go. <laughs> all right. Perfect. You can see all the wonderful pictures Tom has taken in the back. Right. <laughs> Having traveled with both of you a little bit, uh, I saw Tom's fascination for taking pictures. It was amazing. <laughs> yes. Now we've had, we have a big TV here showing our pictures from all the many years, and it kind of reminds us of all the great places we've been to. I've got some really nice pictures from, from India, too. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, very, very informative, very engaging uh, talk. I think also very relevant uh, to what people are going. So thank you very much, Mary, for that. There is a whole bunch of questions that people are asking. So without much delay, I'll quickly jump in and start okay. taking questions. Uh, so the first question I see here is from Rajiv. Uh, so Rajiv is asking, in your opinion, what could be one good software-related trend uh, that has its birth in 2020 during this COVID time that you think will continue beyond 2020? Kevin, Ken? I think it was one of the points Mary made here, which is that um, software is a contributor to a team that solves problems. It's not the solution all by itself. It's not that somebody tells uh, people with software skills what to do. It's that they collaborate with other folks with other um, capacities to solve emerging and rapidly evolving problems. I Let's say one thing I don't think it's going to be. So we heard a lot about artificial intelligence was going to become really big in 2020. But what has happened is that the databases used to train artificial intelligence have suddenly not become relevant anymore because everything's changed. So a huge amount of the AI training that's, that had gone on has become suspect, if not irrelevant. So... Um, so I don't think that's it, but I do think that we need to figure out how to respect the people that are solving these problems, the ones that are on, on the front lines making stuff happen, and give them uh, give them the the respect of telling them here's what a solution looks like and let's make it happen. I think that we've seen a trend this way, and I think it's a revert a reversion to where software used to be back when I first started coding. <laughs> um, and I'd, I'd like to see more of it. I think instead of let's do the tasks, some other people line up, we have to start expecting software engineers to be part of a problem solving team. And, and when things have to be really fast, there just is no time for any of the other processes and any of the other gatherings or anything else. You just have to get everybody together and get them in the room and say, you've got three days, make this happen. And I think that that'll continue more, more of that will continue. Awesome. All right. So moving on. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, we, uh, there's a question from Vinaya uh, where she's asking about what are your thoughts on Kanban? Uh, seems to check many of the boxes you mentioned. Could you read the first Kanban. one? Oh, on Kanban. So um, Kanban is a term that came from uh, 
Japan and was used in lean manufacturing back when I did lean manufacturing. Um, and Kanban was a mechanism to pull from demand. And we set it up and used it in our plants. And if you think about the, the software version of Kanban, it is a mechanism to track pulling from demand and making sure that um, you use some sort of a pull mechanism. Kanban actually means card, and in our manufacturing plant, we actually use those cards to pull. So in my background, which predates software Kanban by quite a bit, I've always thought of Kanban as a tool for pulling from demand. Now, software Kanban um, is a lot of other things. It's, its idea of minimizing work in process isn't the, is, is a fundamental important piece of it. But I think this whole concept of pulling from demand is something that whether you call it Kanban or something else, it's, it's, it's a fundamental aspect of being resilient, of being able to respond fast to events the way that they unfold. And um, many of the tools in Kanban are interesting tools for figuring out how to pull from demand. Um, other pieces of Kanban, uh, as you sort of expand it and talk about the culture that surrounds it, wouldn't necessarily be any different than other agile things, I don't think, but i um, not sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving to the next question uh, from Shalini. Uh, <coughs> amazing, uh, and thank you so much for uh, so much the need of the R. Uh, how do you build this culture uh, sustainably in an organization? That starts from the top of the organization, the philosophy of what people think is important. Um, so if you have an organization that's basically successful and they've been doing things in a certain way for a lot of years, you can't just go in and say, change what's been successful. Where I see sustainable change in culture is when there are shock waves that come through either from a stream event like we've just had or from very surprising competition, like for example, Kodak and Fujifilm faced and, uh, uh, you know, digital competition. And suddenly what you were doing before doesn't work and the senior management has to think differently. The only um, real successes that I've seen in totally changing the whole company culture have come when uh, the, the, the heads of the company get their head together and communicate it down through the ranks we're going to have a, just a different way of doing things, a different philosophy. It doesn't just mean the top management thinks it's good. It means that top management is able to change the way the structure of the company is and what's rewarded and what's thought of as good to make it happen. And as Martin Fowler always liked to say, you have to either change your company or change your company. Dang. No. Okay. Perfect. Uh, we'll take one last question here. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, this is from uh, all right here. Uh, you mentioned about queues. My question is during the uh, during the unprecedented, uh, unpredictable sorry, uh, unpredictable disruptive times. Uh, what could be some efficient ways we can manage queues, or is there a better way? Uh, than managing queues for better outcomes. You just stop having queues. Delete them. Get rid of them. That's the most efficient thing. I mean, and in fact, any time that you're working on queues, backlogs or anything like that, you're just wasting time. I consider queues a waste. Um, we were talking to, once upon a time, a healthcare company in Seattle that... Um, was just so resistant to what we were talking about. And we discovered that in the vicinity of 20 to 25% of the people, and they were all management people in a room of about 20, spent full time managing queues. And they, of course, couldn't really accept what we were saying because their job was going to go away. But you don't need to set priorities. You do not need to have backlogs, and they're just plain bad ideas. It is not necessary to have queues and if you have queues, 
you have to just figure out how to get rid of them. It, I, there's no good way to, to, to take something that you should not have and say, how do I make it better? It's like, get rid of it. A cue is essentially a push mechanism. You decide ahead of time what you're going to do, and then you commit to doing it. And if your learning indicates that there's something else that you should be doing instead, well, you've already committed. Uh, push mechanisms are very inefficient. They are very expensive. They are not very effective. So instead of pushing with a cue, you pull with goals. You have sub-goals. You do whatever it takes in order to achieve the next most important thing. Um, okay. Is it fair to say that if you know you may have uh, you may have a list of things that you've got from different places, uh, and you want a place to to just capture them as a, as a log or as a list, but then you start pulling based on goals from it. Is that is that still considered as a cue? Well, remember, you can only complete work at the rate at which you can complete work, and if you're right. accepting work at a higher rate, you're saying where can I park it. Well, that's an interesting concept, but you're accepting work at a higher rate than you can accomplish it. It's much better to say, I've got three things, now, next, and never, okay? This is what I'm doing now. This is what I'm going to do next, and everything else goes into my never list. Now, you can have a never list. Um, every software organization I know of, almost, 95%, have more work than they can possibly handle. So they will always have stuff coming in that has to go into this never list or on the floor, one or the other. Um, I was working with a very senior executive from a well-known company here that was quite successful after that in the U.S. And, and um, he got this concept and then we went and visited. He was in one of our classes really early on. And a few years later, we gave a talk in his company, which was, by that time was quite big. And he said, you know, the best thing you ever told me, Mary, was have a never list. Because if you put stuff on your never list, you know what? I will bet you never look at it again. Because what's urgent now is what you're going to be paying attention to. And if you're refreshing what you think about doing from the most current problems instead of stuff that's five and ten and, you know, seven months or weeks old, you are actually doing a better job of choosing than stacking this stuff up. It is better to say to the people who are sending demand at you, look, here's my capacity. I'm going to tell you when you ask me something if I have capacity to put it on my list. And if I don't have capacity, I'm going to tell you right away. And that gives that demand generator a way better at lots of options than maybe hoping that someday you're going to get around to their thing by the time that you do it, it will be obsolete, but hey, at least they got it on your list. That doesn't, that doesn't do your demand generators any good, your customers any good, and it doesn't do you any good to have this. So if you got to have a list, put it on a never list, and I'm going to bet you, you'll never look at it. But it'll be there just in case you think you should watch it. And hopefully if something's really important, it'll come back again, and you, you, know, you can deal with it when it comes back. Uh, if it's really important, it'll come back. But if it comes back two and three times, it means you basically don't have the capacity to deal with it because you're using your capacity to something that you uh, you have decided time and time again is more important. So um, that means you either have to increase your capacity or it has to go somewhere else if it's really important. But it is so much better to be honest about that than to pretend that maybe someday you are going to be able to do it. And it could be reframed in a way that makes it easier to deal with or faster to deal with or something that really is more important than um, the, the competing idea from some other source of demand. But um, I don't think putting stuff on a list to hopes that maybe you'll, by thinking about it harder, get around to doing it. I don't think it does anybody any good. Not the people that have the, the request, not the team that has to work on it, not anybody. It's just a bad idea. Perfect. 
All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, one last question. I know we're running a little late, but I think I love this question. This is from Sakshi. Uh, she's asking, uh, you talked about providing freedom to the team. Sometimes freedom turns to chaos, uh, especially in, in meetings. Uh, any suggestion how to limit these situations? Okay, so remember I talked also about the philosophy of responsibility. All right? So um, the team knows what it needs to achieve, and it needs to know when it needs to achieve that. It needs to know the constraints around the uh, achievement, and it needs to know its piece in the bigger system. All right? Um, and in my experience, if I look at the companies that are really successful, most of these small teams have responsible leaders. Um, in the chief engineer model, there's a, a chief engineer that is the responsible leader that owns responsibility for delivering on that thing that the team is responsible for. And at some point in time, that leader has to say, okay, we've had enough discussion. We're heading this direction. And um, we, we have to do this. Here's our goal. So let's say you were trying to do a um, curbside pickup software and you had to have it done in a week. There's one person who's leading a team of seven, and that person is responsible for having it. And there's some arguments about which way is best. Those are good because it gives a lot of ideas. And at some point in time, the leader says, okay, we've spent three hours on this. That's all the time we have. We're going to make a choice and move on. And we're going to go with that choice and try it out because it's all the time we have. So there has to be a way to move forward and not argue. If you take a look at um, open source, there is always the, the, the what, benevolent dictator that does that occasionally, not very often, but occasionally to keep things moving on. And um, in a chief engineer model, there is a responsible engineer who owns responsibility and passes it to the team. Um, to have a team that has no body, that has the capability of saying, we're going to head next, isn't an engineering model, okay? The team has freedom about how to pursue solutions to the problem it's trying to address. But the freedom comes with constraints, schedule constraints, cost constraints, um, access to skills and resource constraints. But within those constraints, you have freedom to choose how to proceed. Um, the control really comes from the constraints. There's a really interesting book called Think Like Amazon by, mm, I forget, you have to look it up. He's, he, was, uh, he was the head of Amazon when Amazon put up its, its merchant website. And they had an interesting way of doing it. They said, you have a small team. And the first thing that this guy did when he joined and took this job on was to negotiate his, what was he was responsible for. And his responsibility, he said, goes like this. Um, a merchant will be able in the middle of the night to log on to our platform and by morning will be able to have a sale that to the customer will look just exactly like it was an Amazon sale. That was the definition of success. And that definition was what the team worked for until they were done. That's how they, if they met that goal, if they were able to put something up that, that met the goal, then they got to proceed. They had a limited amount of time they had a customer-focused goal that was pretty clear, and, um, and he led a team, and he was responsible for that team that made that happen. And when you have a customer-focused goal, almost every AWS service works like that. They have a customer-focused goal that they can say that defines success. They have a leader. Uh, they have 10, 12 people. They have constraints. Uh, and within that window, they have to figure out how to make the service work. And if you look at SpaceX, it'll be the same thing. Um, you have a launch, a test launch. It's in three months. And the purpose of this test launch is to, to test how the landing legs connect with the ship out in the wavy water and just see if they can lock in. Okay. And you got three months. And on, you know, 
uh, May 31st, the launch will happen. Ed, you know what? That's not going to change. It's going to be May 31st. It's going to go up, and it's going to try to land in the ocean, and if your legs aren't ready to lock in, well, too bad, um, because it's going to be tested, and you, you have to be ready. And so you have a team that has that goal. They know what they have to do. They know where the legs fit in. They have to work with the crew on the ship to make sure they know how the locking mechanism works. And you can have arguments about the best way to do it. But May 30th isn't going to move. And you can only have arguments up to a certain amount of time before you have to start trying stuff. And you have to have two or three different different uh, strategies because when May 30th comes, one of them has to be in place and working. And when you have that um, uh, you know the constraints, you know the deadline, you know when things are going to be tested, and you have a, a leader, typically with SpaceX, so it'll be an engineer who is responsible to make sure that these five people get that landing leg figured out, communicate with the boat people on how it's going to lock in, and then test and see how it works. And that test will happen, and it will work or it won't, and um, the engineering team and the chief engineer are responsible for whatever happens. And in that world, you know, you can absolutely have to have arguments. It's good to have arguments. You also have to move forward, and you have to have everybody responsible for making sure that they're going to be ready for that next deadline. People are loving that. <laughs> you can see yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that. <laughs> That's really neat. <laughs> All right. I think uh, we've... Uh, taken a lot of your time. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mary and Tom. Uh, it was such an honor to have you back and uh, such an amazing topic. So uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you.